Hey there YouTube, this is SJM4306. In today's video, we'll look at how I made this 128 by 40 LED display. But first, a word from this video sponsor, JLCPCB. Got an idea for a circuit, widget, or device that you want a rapid prototype or sell? Check out JLCPCB. They offer their board manufacturing services starting at two bucks for five boards, and only take a few days from start to finish. So make sure to check out JLC PCB. And once again, thanks for making this video possible. Now let's get on with the video. Okay, yeah, this is the uh, LED matrix I made. And these are standard, uh, they come in uh, four segment, well, four eight by eight matrices in a row. And you can see here, uh, I have everything daisy chain pretty much with the exception of so each display is controlled by one SPI bus and that those are these bundles of wires here and it'll display four rows of text and they're 128 pixels wide so there's four of the um, four by one displays there's one here one here one here and then one here and so total uh, each kind of 128 by uh, 64 um, uses, what would that be, 16 displays. And so right now I only have enough uh, to, to complete five rows. I, I still need to assemble three more uh, rows in order to get the full 128 by 64 um, display. So the way I have it wired is uh, all the displays share the same data and clock, and they just have a separate chip enable, and uh, like a chip select pin. And so far, I haven't run into any issues with um, with like a fan out or like a latency. I'm bit banging the SPI because I need uh, two separate buses, and I wanted to run them a little bit slower. I can probably speed it up, but once I get the other three displays wired, I'll see if there's any. Um, any like clock skew issues or race conditions or anything like that, that'll screw up my communications. And if that becomes an issue, I might have to leave this update pretty slow. As you saw in the video, it takes a little while for it to scroll the display. It's not instantaneous. And that, like I said, is because I'm bit banging the SPI. So I can make it much, much faster if I use the hardware based SPI peripheral in the AT Mega. And if that works, great. If not, then I might have to leave it like this, so the update rate would be relatively slow, but at least it would work. You can definitely see there's like a gradient. So the first display is the brightest, then it starts getting dimmer and dimmer, and by the time it gets to the bottom, you can see this is a, a second SPI bus. It's powered separately, and you can see it's significantly, well, not significant, it's noticeably brighter than the uh, previous row. So what I'm going to have to do is um, I'm just daisy chaining power all through these modules. So there's like massive drop. So I'm going to have to um, make a power bus, basically, like a, a bus bar and power each kind of row uh, separately in parallel and get a much beefier supply. Right now, I'm only running this off of the five volt pin on the Arduino, which is not a great thing to do for how many displays I have. But even then, you can see here. It's uh, 5 volts, and it's only drawing a little more than a quarter of an amp, which is actually kind of impressive. I was expecting a lot more for this number of characters displayed on this large of a display. But yeah, you can see here, it goes in, goes all the way to the end, goes down, goes to the end here, goes down, goes to the end, and then, you know, that's it. So this is fully uh, double buffered, so it's buffered obviously once within these displays, so once you write to a display, it'll keep that data. However, I need to buffer it again within my um, AT Mega. So to connect the entire display, you really only need like 10 wires minimum. So five per, which is actually pretty cool. So yeah, this is almost the full uh, character font. I'm, I'm still adding some random characters and whatnot. Okay, here's the software. You can see I'm, I'm bit banging the SPI bus. And you can see the two chip selects, I call them LD just because that's what the module calls them. So LD1 and LD2, and each SPI chip select can drive like four of the rows. 
So for a total of eight, so that's how you get these 64 um, vertical pixels. And they both share the same data in clock. You can see here I have my font map and it's a program, I'm using the, the modifier program so that it forces it to be stored in flash because there's quite a bit of uh, data stored in here and I was actually starting to run out of room in the memory uh, because it was it was loading into SRAM. So the ATmega 328P has 32K flash, but it only has, I believe, 2K SRAM. So you can see here, they're all arranged in, in the order of, of ASCII, so I, I can just directly address them using uh, an offset. And you'll see that later in the code. But yeah, you can see here is the entire font basically stored. Beyond that, I have a couple of declarations that help me keep track of you know how wide the display is, uh, how much memory I need to reserve. So for 128 by 64, I need to reserve 1,024 uh, bytes. And you can see here, this is, I just filled out some random data just to test the, um, the display buffer function. But the buffer itself takes up a K of memory, which is pretty much half, well, yeah, half the memory of the AT Mega. <laughs> so yeah. Other than that, I have just a like a, a send serial command function. I have another one to send like display data. And here's the actual function that does pretty much all the important stuff. Uh, I call it draw buff, like draw buffer. And basically all that does is because there's two displays, it'll it actually executes twice. So in this case, D is for displays. So each display being 128 by 32. And so here, what it does is the actual pix pixel data is written. It's really odd. The way that the, the modules are arranged, you would think that it would be by column. So there's, you know, each module is four, four um, times eight. So 32 pixels by eight. You think it would just draw like any other display where it does each vertical column and then bam, you're done. No, but instead it actually draws um, the first byte you send it, it draws the lower left row, just eight pixels wide, and then it goes to the next row. And so it does one display, one eight by eight display first, and then it gets shifted to the next display. So everything's kind of like sideways and only addressable eight by eight at a time, which is really weird. So if you read the data sheet, it, it makes a lot more sense what I'm saying. But the annoying thing about that is I can't, write like a single line at a time. I kind of have to do it split up into eight by eight blocks. And that's why I have this while uh, row is less than eight. And so what it does is it reads the buffer data and it it accumulates for a single uh, one by eight row. It accumulates all the data that should be there uh, and then sends that over to the display. And it does this and it stacks um, you know, each row, each one by eight uh, row up until it's completed one eight by eight cell, and then it moves on to the next one. So it, this is really confusing. And when I was actually uh, initially programming for these displays, it really confused the heck out of me too, because I'm used to writing to a lot of um, OLED displays and LCD displays that none of them work like this at all, <laughs> which is really weird. Anyway, if the module manufacturer actually rotated each of the display, the eight by eight displays by 90 degrees. I wouldn't have to do any of this and it would be so much simpler, but that's just the way they're wired. So anyway, it does this and I have to determine whether it's even or odd because even displays, um, the data flows left to right and then it comes back down and it flows right to left because they're daisy chained in series like an S. And so I need to, every odd uh, display, I need to actually flip the data and mirror it. Otherwise the data would be upside down and backwards, <laughs> which is really odd. But this way will make wiring a lot easier. So I had to implement it that way. Beyond that, I have a function to set the X and Y coordinate. I'm using an index um, and it goes from zero to 1024. And that's just indexing the entire display buffer. 
And so here you can see I am just um, multiplying, you know, the Y value. So the way that I want to address this display is 0 to 128 is the X, um, the location, you know, horizontally. And then Y would be 0 to 7 to reference which row I'm writing to. Additionally, I have a, a print char function, which just takes the ASCII character and then prints it wherever the display index is left last. In addition to that, we have a write string function, which takes that print char function and then just whatever string you give it, it iteratively prints each character until it gets to the end of the string, which is pretty simple. Then I have a clear display function, which just uh, clears the index, so it resets it back to the home position, 0, 0, the upper left corner, and then it clears the entire buffer, and then it forces a, re a rewrite of the buffer to the display. And within my setup function, I have, other than initializations, I have a just a general initialization of the entire display. I set the intensity to the lowest value, I have it scan all columns, I turn off the display test, and I sh disable decode mode, and I shut off, shut down, <laughs> so that's set, set into normal operation. And this is necessary for the displays to actually be visible. And once we get into my main loop here, I just have it go through and print. You'll notice that I use, for the strings, I'm using the f helper function, which is it basically stores the contents of the string in flash so it doesn't consume SRAM. And yeah, it just goes through and that's pretty much the end of the program. And if I just compile here, you'll see how much memory we are actually using. So we're using 18% of our flash, which out of 32, about 32K, but here it says maximum 30, just a, a little more than 30K, that's because I'm guessing the bootloader takes up a little bit. So there's that. And then our global variables, which represent SRAM, we're using 51%. Yeah, so we have about a K left, a little less. But yeah, so that's something I'm going to have to manage as I'm adding functionality to this. I need to add a serial port and then have it uh, be able to talk to like a ESP wire Wi-Fi module. So that's sort of next step. Uh, this was just generally a proof of concept so that I could print out a bunch of stuff <laughs> on the display, all this stuff. And I'm probably going to use this for data predominantly. So displaying time, weather, traffic, whatever you want, something like that. So I don't really need like 60 hertz refresh rate. So it's okay if the text is a little bit laggy. Uh, but, like I said, if I can make it faster, then I definitely will try. But anyway, yeah, this is the first video. I need to, um, steps for after this, I need to make a mount for this because they're all just floating. And the wires, if I flip this over very carefully, I'll show you. I just soldered. Uh, I, the original pins are just like 0.1 inch right angle headers. And I actually just uh, cut off the black part and bent the pins over, cut them short, and then just directly soldered them. And I did that for like all the, the connections between the four displays in each row. And that works for like a, a, an electrical connection, but it's not very mechanically stable. I actually had to put some tape on each of the, like, the dividing sections. So some of these characters, you might notice, they look maybe a little bit fuzzy or something that's just some scotch tape over it to mechanically stabilize a little bit. But anyway, I'm going to have to make a mount for this. I'm thinking some kind of thin wood and 3D printing some mounts that'll actually go right into the, the pegs. Now, unfortunately, because they didn't socket the LED displays, they have these nice screw mounts and I can't screw into them because I'd have to desolder, you know, the displays in order to get access to the other side. So that, that sort of, sort of stinks, but... I'll make do. I'll 3D print some like peg mounts that these can kind of slot into and I'll mount that to a piece of wood that's large enough and the controller itself I'm not sure I'm probably not going to end up using the 18 mega 328. I might have it as a like a, 
a host controller for the display itself, but I'm probably going to go with an ESP8266 or ESP32 and have that connect to the internet and pretty much do all the heavy lifting and maybe this will just be a sub controller that its only job is to push pixels to the display basically and to buffer the display and yeah that's about it i haven't really done any animation i haven't done any scrolling uh that's not strictly necessary i can definitely add that in if i have enough memory left after i'm done with everything else but yeah other than that very happy with this all in all um I think the LEDs cost like about 100, 120, maybe like that. So this is definitely not the cheapest project. And I found some of them that are a little bit finicky. Like there must be uh, dry solder joints underneath some of these. If you press or bend it, some of the segments will flicker. So I might have to actually desolder some of these, figure out where those are, desolder them. And yeah, you can see this one. <laughs> so yeah, that one I'm going to have to desolder that chip and, or the LED and inspect all the solder joints on the, the Max chip underneath it and resolder them. That's probably likely the issue. But yeah, I'll figure all that out. This is just part one of the video. Part two will be kind of more physical construction of the final display that will hang on my wall and figuring out power supply because even though it's great, it can run off just a USB port definitely kind of starving some of these lower displays of power and I want it to be uniform and bright. Uh, these displays have I think like 16 levels of brightness. I'm currently running them at the lowest level because well you can see there's quite a bit of, of drop in brightness and if I push it too high like two or three levels higher than this you can actually start to see some of the displays kind of flickering and I'm guessing that's because of the voltage drop after it goes through all these and they're usually these two will start flickering so i'm guessing the voltage drop is going just a little bit too low and maybe the multiplex frequency needs to be tweaked or something like that to account for that but anyway yeah i've rambled on for long enough a uh, huge thanks for jlc pcb for sponsoring this video uh, i normally would not spend like 120 dollars on leds uh, but they they happily foot the bill, so I'm able to do crazy projects like this. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, if you guys have any ideas what else I could do with a large uh, 128 by 64 LED display, uh, put them down below. I was thinking um, like a Game Boy, hook it up to an actual, like an FPGA and then to a Game Boy so that I could display the Game Boy image. Problem with these displays are they don't do uh, grayscale. They don't, they do display wide grayscale. So I can only modify the grayscale in an 8x8 patch. I can't do individual pixels. So that's sort of a limitation. Another thing that I could do possibly is hook this up to an Ardu Boy. So this will be the exact resolution once I'm done, once I finish the three rows at the bottom there. This will be the exact resolution of an Ardu Boy, and an Ardu Boy just uses a mono screen. So this would be perfect for displaying games like that. The only issue is... I would need to definitely beef up the controller and I, I don't think I could get away with serial, serially driving um, the displays as I am because it's just way too slow. It would never be able to get a decent frame rate. So I would need to beef that up to make it at least 30 frames per second refresh. With this so far, it took me a couple hours just assembling the LEDs, cutting them and soldering them together and all it took like probably like two to three hours and then writing the software took probably about as long thanks for watching see you in the next video